Hello everyone, I hope you are safe and well. My name is Aya Shebi, I'm the African Union Youth Envoy. Thank you for joining today and welcome to another virtual African Union Youth Consultation on COVID-19. This is the sixth uh, of a series of eight public webinars. So every Wednesday I host a special guest uh, who is an African Union leader and decision maker with whom you engage directly and you ask your questions live. So if you want to ask, just click on the Q&A tab. We will also go uh, live on Facebook, so you can check out a Youth Envoy Facebook page. And we will also be running uh, polls uh, live as well, so make sure you participate and make your voice heard in this topic. Uh, you, stay, uh, you may stay till the end with us because we will have a message from uh, former Secretary General of the UN, uh, SG Ban Ki-moon. So make sure you stay till the end with us. But today I have a very, very special guest uh, with me, Her Excellency Professor Sarah Agbor, the African Union Commissioner of Human Resources, Science and Technology, who has a big portfolio under which there is science, technology, education and youth, among others. And we will be discussing today education and e-learning in the next 20 minutes. Um, Sarah Agbor is a very busy commissioner, so we have to really try to make uh, or maximize the uh, discussion with her in this short time. I want to ask you first, Commissioner, how are you? How are you doing with the pandemic? We haven't seen you in a while on social media, so tell us how is everything going? Thank you very much, Aya. We are coping with the lockdown. Although we are always in the office, even though there is a lockdown, but again, we have re we, we, we've reduced the number of staff that actually come to the office. Uh, we thank God that the African Union Commission as a commission and as a body have not been affected by the COVID in a big dimension. We had only one case and the person has gotten well, so we are fine, we are healthy, and I hope the youth of Africa are also doing very well. Wherever you may be, remember safety first. We, Without life, you cannot achieve. So we need our lives. And so we need to secure that life. So I hope that the youth of Africa are also doing very well and keeping safe Absolutely. and following the WHO instructions that Absolutely. we need to follow. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And uh, I Thank will you. go straight to the first question. Is from Kinter from Kisumu County in Kenya. She's asking, does the African Union have an education department? And if so, what is the role of that department? So I think, you know, many young people may not know that there is a whole division of education doing amazing work. Yeah. Thank you very much for that question, Kinsey. Um, I've not even appreciated you as a person, Aya, before I go into your question. First, I want to applaud the Youth Envoy for the initiative and for choosing a topic that will redefine teaching and learning processes during COVID-19 and beyond, education and e-learning. Because what COVID is teaching us right now is that we need to do business as unusual. And already, you know, for us in Africa, we already have a problem with our educational system. So now we must get our belts and make sure that we do the right thing. Does the African Union have an education department? Yes. That Department of Human Resources, Science and Technology is divided into three divisions. We have education as a division, we have science, technology, innovation as a division, and then the third one is human resources and youth. So those are the three divisions that make up the Department of Human Resources, Science, and Technology. There is no way we can develop human capital without consolidating on education, because human capital is what speaks to our, 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 our education. Africa must invest in the skills of its people in order to advance their standard of living. Because currently, 30 million primary school age children in sub-Saharan Africa do not go to school. And 40% of Africans over the age of 15 and 50% of women above the age of 25 are illiterate. So we need improved access to education in order to work in skilled trades and earn higher, um, higher wages. The vision of Agenda 2063 Kingston is that vision of an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa driven by its own competent and skilled citizens able to play in the global arena. This is the mandate that we are taking now, the competence and the skilled persons and the, and the importance of, 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 of developing human capital is one of the mandate of the education division of the Human Resources Science and Technology Department. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do in our in that division is to promote education 
to re-evaluate re and monitor our educational system. And that is why we have what we call the Specialized Technical Committee on Education, Science and Technology, which is a ministerial meeting of all ministers of education, science and technology. Now, there is also a continental strategy that boosts education. It is the Continental Educational Strategy for Africa, CISA 2016-2025. Why do we speak of 2016-2025? It's because the blueprint of the Africa we want, Agenda 2063, is a 50-year program. That the vision is that by 2063, Africa should be able to have transformed to the Africa we want. So they divided into it into five phases of 10 years each. And for each of the 10 years, there is a map out a, that we need to work on. And for the education system, it is the continental education strategy for Africa. And this is because we recognize the importance of ease of access to education for young people. So under this continental education strategy for Africa, we have 12 thematic objectives that also have 12 thematic clusters. Like under that, how do we get ourselves good education? There's early child education, there is higher education, there is TVET, there is STEM, there is curriculum review, there is long, um, um, lifelong learning, and, um, and many others that also improve the teacher training professional program, etc., mm -hmm. and higher education. So those are the parts of, uh, mm -hmm. those are the different thematic um, clusters of the continental education um, strategy for Africa. Now, so, okay, Aya, yes, here. Commissioner, I wanted to uh, quickly bring in uh, a young Angolan, since you also were talking about the, the education strategy and the Pan-African universities that we have across the continent that is really uh, driving a lot of the Pan-African agenda because many Africans from different countries can then, you know, study in each other countries and in a Pan-African mm -hmm. environment. So um, yeah. a young Angolan, his name, Elder Afonso, he has an MSc in governance and regional integration. He is studying at the Pan-African University. And I want to give him the floor for three minutes to also make an intervention. Elder. All right. Thank you so much, Aya. Uh, I think uh, I'm not able to activate my video, but I will uh, ask the question as, okay. So, uh, firstly, uh, thank you for the opportunity. And I will say um, the COVID-19 has impacted uh, all of us a lot and myself as a student. I've recently moved from Cameroon to India uh, to just start my internship as a part of the program because uh, uh, Pan-African University requires a student to do an internship uh, for practical experiences uh, regarding to what we are, are learning. But unfortunately, since I arrived in India, uh, the first two weeks uh, I've been quarantined. Uh, I was self-quarantined because of uh, the historic of traveling. And later on, we started a lockdown. It has been three months since uh, I am in the country and I haven't started my internship yet. So it's actually a situation that I'm going through, but we, we will all manage. But uh, also I would like to ask a question uh, regarding to e-learning. So, I, I know that AU is moving to e-learning approaches. And uh, my question will, 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 will be, how do we go with e-learning approaches, considering that uh, very few people in Africa have access to the internet? And yet, regarding to technical related uh, subjects, what will be the best approach to be used for teaching and learning uh, regarding to practical subjects. I, I, I think of uh, agriculture and um, engineering and some other courses. So how do AU think to go about uh, 
uh, that issues related to teaching and learning uh, sub practical subjects. And um, also, uh, thank you for the opportunity, huh? but uh, uh, we have also some students at Pan-African University facing issues related to uh, online teaching. Uh, but I, I think, uh, I think, I, I don't want to go to that question, but uh, that's go the ahead, one that I did. You can ask. Basically. No, no, I, I think that's enough. That's enough uh, uh, related to technical and practical subjects. All right. And thank you so much. Thank you very much, Elder, for that. Commissioner, what do you think about this challenge of many students having their education disrupted because of access to internet? We know that more than 70% of Africa is offline and maybe the Pan-African universities are trying to adapt, but many students like Elder are facing a lot of challenges. I don't even think that students like um, Elder should be facing challenges because they are in the city. Where you are speaking about the bulk that cannot have access to these um, IT skills. And those are the ones in the rural areas or even in towns where they don't have ice, um, um, broad connectivity and um, broadband uh, mechanisms. Um, um, Elder, thank you for your question. I'm actually intrigued that you're actually going to do your internship in India. I'm really surprised about that because I know Pan-African University, we think Pan-African first. So we think about kind of projects within Africa itself. So I'm really, really surprised. And, and I'm sure if you are doing governance, you are in Cameroon. Your school is the one in Cameroon, okay? Elder? Yes, yes, it is. Your, your school is, is one in Cameroon. So I'm really wondering what took you to India. Maybe you are doing a comparative study on governance or something. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's a multinational company, oh, and uh, okay. I'm looking at their policies towards Africa. Okay, okay, that okay, I understand yes. that. Okay, so I want to say first, um, congratulations for being one of the very few into Pan African University. But again, in Pan African University, the Pan African University that we have, and like Aya rightly said, they are all at master's level, master's and PhD levels. They are not at undergraduate levels, and uh, and we have different thematic. Um, clusters of the Pan-African University, like the one in Cameroon is on governance, humanities, and social sciences. The one in Algeria, hosted in Algeria to represent North Africa, is the Pan-African University for Water, Energy, and Climate Change. The one in Kenya, representing East Africa, is the Pan-African University for Science, Technology, and Innovation, hosted by the Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture in, uh, and Technology. The one in Nigeria is hosted, uh, is the Pan-African University for life and earth sciences, including, um, including health and agriculture, um, representing West Africa. And then the last but not the least is the Pan-African University for Space Science, which is supposed to have taken off because it is hosted by South Africa, but we have uh, a bit of problematics there. The question on, um, on how do we go about the online, online learning? In fact, like you rightly stated, Elder, COVID, has taught us that we need to brace ourselves up and we need to change the way we work because it's no longer going to be business unusual. It's no longer going to be the four walls of the classroom for teaching. So, and you know that one of the flagship projects we have under the, Afrin, uh, under the African Union is the Pan-African Virtual and E-University, which was launched in December 20th last year and the first courses took off January 15th this year. And, and this also goes with the prioritization of His Excellency Dr. Musa Fakim Mohammed on the 1 million by 2021 initiative where we feel that we need to deliver um, opportunities to at least 1 million youth by 2021. And it is because we want to catalyze on youth development and leveraging partnerships with stakeholders in the private and development sector. Now the question of the on scholarship, alternative fathers and teacher development is part of what we have under education. Now, how do we translate these courses? Because you've asked a very, a very technical question. The one that those courses that need practicals, like you said, agriculture, and I'm sure biochemistry, like the students who are in life and earth sciences in, 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 in Nigeria, how do we do online teaching? Because without the practicals, how do they actually get the competence and the skills they actually need? That is the question you've asked us. But the good thing is that 
we have many partners who are into online teaching who have gotten involved with the Pan African Virtual and e University. And we also had the Specialized Technical Committee on Education Science and Technology Extraordinary Meeting in April because we're looking at the difficulties of teaching with the very questions that you've raised, Elder, with these very, very questions. How do you translate an online class into a virtual class that can have practicals? It's possible. I've been to countries where they showed us where they were doing remote teaching. But to do remote teaching, we also need connectivity. To get connectivity, you also need good electricity. Now, how is it possible that we can extend to, because we say online teaching is breaking down the barriers, no classrooms, everybody, anywhere, at any time. That is the definition of online teaching. But how is it going to be everybody, anywhere, at any time, when there's no connectivity? When there is no electricity. So now we have solar. They have the solar energy that they can use in some of those places. If it is, this infrastructure is provided there. Then we are also joining with partners like HP, who are, um, who, for example, on the E of Education, we are partnered with HP to provide at least 200,000 e learning opportunities through the global HP Life Program. The courses that HP is providing to us is uh, business and IT skills training free of charge to people all over the world where the online community and more than 30 um, self-paced courses are designed to help young people develop business and IT skills at their own pace. And we had this discussion with the ministers of education. They need to provide this infrastructure that can actually make remote learning very, very possible. So it is, very, it is an essential question that you have asked. How do we walk the talk, go beyond rhetorics, and condense or collapse the classroom in such a way that people can actually get the competence and skilled courses or training through online teaching? Because if we don't have um, a monitoring evaluation system on looking at these, at these courses and how they go, people will not even trust those degrees when, when we show them that it was an online course. That is why we need to create credibility through the courses and through the ways we are going to do it. Thank so it is, to partner with, it, is, it is to partner with some of these- so Commissioner, uh, HP, Commissioner from, the STC, from the STC meeting, sorry to interrupt because what you're saying is extremely important for young people to hear. From the STC meeting with ministers of education, what was the outcome? Are the ministers committing to improve the uh, infrastructure of the digital divide that is in Africa and which is causing inequality in education. Are they committing to do that? Are they committing that because they are committed? Because when you say AU, when you use the word African Union, it is not here in Ethiopia. The African Union exists in every state. Every member state is a member of the African Union. Education, science, technology can only be implemented at the level of the of the of the of the member state. Not here, where we are the sectarian. You understand what I'm saying? That is why it is a ministerial meeting. It is they, the ministers, they talk about their challenges and they, the ministers, they procure, they, they proffer the solutions. So the, at, the, at the extraordinary STC EST, they assess the impact of COVID on African education systems and they committed to ensuring continuing learning at all education levels. They have committed to it. And through that commitment, they will also look at the infrastructure available in their own different nations. Mm -hmm. And out of that, they will also partner with some of these partners we are bringing to help them improve their infrastructure so that online learning can actually be one of the takes that they take from this. So they are actually committed. Thank it's you. their responsibility. We, 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 it's not, there's no negotiation about it because we need to do what we need to do right. If we say that the youth of Africa, they are our future, for them to become that future, they need to be prepared today. And that preparation is first consolidated under education. So they are actually committed. And out of that, just like you're having this webinar, Aya, we, we have, we've also had series um, of webinars with policymakers and education systems technology providers where organized to properly dissect tools and resources needed so that we don't just put our hands to the unknown, but knowing what we want and then putting our money right there to make sure that we give the best to our children. It's a, it's a duty, it's a duty, and it's not something we negotiate. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, for that uh, excellent
clarification uh, for Elder. Elder, thank you very much for joining us. And, and, then, and then maybe I should say something again, Aya. You know, we, we also, um, uh, uh, HP, I mentioned HP. They have this uh, HP um, Life Program. They also committed to supporting our member states with their online learning platform for the remainder of this 2020 academic year at no cost. So member states just need to connect with HP. So that is one, or one other thing that we've gotten. And then we've also gotten a policy guideline on digitizing African education systems. This will also go a long way to improve the online teaching and the worries that Helda just brought to focus as we were discussing. Absolutely. Um, so the next question, uh, uh, Elder has uh, just left. So thank you very much, Elder, and all the best. The next question comes from Agnes, and she is saying, what is the AU doing to ensure that girls who become pregnant or get married can also continue with alternative schooling now? Where, where is it available? When are the schools are going to open? And is there any good practices that member states shared on this? Yeah, there are good practices. I think I was um, in Zambia. I think it is in Zambia that FAWE, FAWE is the uh, Forum of African Women Educationists, where they created a school, a model school for teenage pregnant girls so that they don't stop going to school because they are pregnant. Pregnancy is not an illness. So they created that model school. And I think that was in 20. 2017, 2018. So that model school where they have teenage pregnant girls go to school. And then in Lusaka, in Lusaka. And then um, beside the, the school itself, because I saw it, is uh, a nursery where those who already have had kids can drop the kids at uh, their babies, their teenage, uh, their, 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 their babies, less than three months, etc. cetera. And that's nursery. They attend classes, come out and do breastfeeding. Because if we do not do that, the bulk of our girls will not be in school. And because somebody makes a mistake, that mistake should not be life-threatening. That mistake should be, should, we should use it as a springboard to reform the person. So the, the, and that is why in the African Union, we have the International Center for the Education of Female and Girls, which is called AUCFA, Centre International pour l'Education de Femmes et Filles. So, and that is one of the focus of, um, of, 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 of AUCFR. Inequalities, because, you know, to get pregnant is, 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 is a two-way thing, the boy and the girl. But when, when the girl gets pregnant, she's the one who is victimized. The boy continues school, and it is not good. And that is why we need to put a stop to it. Because the girl did not drink the pregnancy. The girl had the pregnancy from a male partner. And that is why if the boy can continue school, then the girl, who is also carrying another future generation should be allowed to, carry, to go on with school. So it, it is one of the policies that we've looked at under the African Union, um, sci, um, the Specialized Sector Committee for Education, Science and Technology on how do we work on these inequalities mm -hmm. and how do we provide schooling for these girls so that they don't stop schooling. So that is already being done in partnership with FAWE. So mm -hmm. we have that. Great, uh, I think this uh, question was answered very clearly. So the, the next question is from John Keen who asks, how do you consider people with disabilities on e-learning? Because you find most of them cannot access e-learning due to different uh, disabilities. They are likely you know, not, not to be able to do that if, if they're hearing impaired uh, or other uh, forms of disability. Uh, we, I, I believe that e-learning for us now, which we have to take 100%, is work in progress. And the way forward is to work with people who are already, who, who already have advanced um, best practices on this. And that is to work with the European community, to work with the, the Western world, et cetera, to see how they've been able to cope with e-learning when it comes to physically challenged people. So we'll take their own best practices and incorporate and contextualize it to that of Africa. It is only that way. I know that um, um, even when I was um, um, I'm deputy vice chancellor at the university, we had a problem with um, blind students because they go to the same classroom with the normal students. But how do they take their own lectures? How can we facilitate their own lectures? So before I left the university, we were thinking of how to even have a different classroom for them. Because during examinations, 
they type their answers. And you see, you are in a, an examination hall with normal, with, the, with those who are not physically challenged, and then you hear the typewriter going clack, 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 clack. It kind of makes you not to concentrate. So they complain. But they too need to be, be, be part of the world that we live in. So we, we have to get in touch with the Baptist mission to help us with prayer. I, I, th I think they, they, their own lectures are called prayer, prayer reading, and having a specialized way that they can listen to lectures and they will understand what is happening in class. And that was being, that was one infrastructure we're bringing into the university. So it is a, because the African Union speaks of inclusivity, leaving no one behind. That should also go beyond rhetorics. We should actually implement it where we do not leave anybody because they are physically disadvantaged or challenged. We should not leave them behind. So that is work in progress for us. And we will learn from the best practices of other countries. Mm -hmm. And that is why the decision of the African Union member states to increase expenditure on education as a percentage of GDP from the 5% to 10% or more will ensure ministries have the right finances to build resilient education system. Mm -hmm. So we must do our duty and we must make sure that we implement these policies and strategies that we have taken mm -hmm. so that everybody can have a sense of belonging. It is very important. Extremely important. And Commissioner, I want to uh, end uh, with a message from you, uh, not, not as the Commissioner of HRC in the African Union, but as an educator, as someone who goes into the classroom and really, um, you know, nurture generations and generations of young people. To all the young people who are listening to us, who are always, you know, very hungry for mentorship, for looking at their career development for, uh, you know, in that space between finishing your degree, finding a job, finding your identity, what would be your inspiring message to these young people trying to find their way, trying to find out what should I study, uh, what uh, job career sh should I follow? So when you are in the classroom talking to all these young people and, and inspiring them, you know, to pursue their dreams, what do you tell them? I first start with myself. I'm a poor man's daughter. I'm somebody whose life has been impacted by education. My parents knew the value of education and they made sure they gave me the right kind of education. With education, like my father said, when you don't have a godfather, education becomes your godfather. Your certificates become your godfather and it opens doors for you. So take the challenge of your education and to school and to properly school and understand in whatever subject you are doing, like what my, my, my counselor used to tell me, the course you read is not even what is most important, but have you reached the zenith of that course? Because when you read the zenith of that course, then you become, um, 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 you become um, an authority in it. So take your education, and education is not just book work, because we say education without ethics is nothing but barbarism, without etiquette is nothing but barbarism. So your education must be holistic, and your education must be seen in the way you speak, the way you see, the way you hear and the way you understand. The going might be tough right now, but there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. Because we say when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. Yeah, you can say, how, how, how is that possible? When I cannot even afford my textbooks, borrow textbooks from your friends. When they are sleeping, use their textbooks and read. You will end up having your certificate. Don't read to pass your exams. Read to acquire knowledge. Because when you read to pass just the exams, it does not define you. It does not speak about your person, but read to understand and to acquire knowledge. Don't ever give up in whatever you do as a life endeavor. You might decide not to go to a formal school and you're in a technical school. That is even more important because at the end of the day, you become an entrepreneur. Now, how do I become an entrepreneur when I don't have money? I saw students in my school who started by selling chewing gum and sweets in the classroom. That is what they were using to eat and to pay their school fees. And today they are in, 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 in offices. So don't ever look down on yourself. The first person that needs to encourage you is you yourself. Believe in yourself, believe in your capability. If somebody made it, you can also make it. Most of the billionaires that you see in this life, they are from very, very poor homes. And they were able to take seriously their education. So don't be disappointed whatever you're facing today. If they face, it will pass over and the good will come. If I look back in the 1990s, when I was in school, I never knew that I would be a commissioner. But all I knew was that I was told, take your job seriously. Even when I finished my education, 
after my PhD, I did 75 applications. Only six people, six organizations responded back to me. Out of 75 applications I made, and when I already had a PhD in 1998, 1999, of the six that have replied back to me, none took me, and I did not give up. You must never give up. Where once there is life, there is hope. No matter how bad the scenario is right now, I tell you, when your vision is right and you, and you continue working, God will send you a helper. So do your work very well, believe in God, and hope beyond hope. And you will be where people will look at you and say, who is this? When did she get here? That is the story of many successful people. Your education is important and humility. Humility is also very, very important. Arrogance will never take you anywhere, but humility will take you where you need to go to. So with that and with prayers, I believe that the sky, I, would, I don't want to use that the sky is your limit because you can go above the sky. You know? <laughs> the yes, you can go above, above the sky. But wherever you are now, no matter how dreary it is, just know that this commissioner speaking to you, this commissioner has known poverty. Just know that this commissioner speaking to you is a poor man's daughter who have risen to this state. And the only way I got here is by dint of hard work and my education and hoping beyond hope with prayers. So I believe that you can achieve more than what I have achieved. You can, because you have people like me, you can easily collect my number if you need mentorship from Aya. I'll be willing to pick your calls. If you can also give them my, um, my WhatsApp number, Aya. Okay. I, I give you the permission to give them my, my WhatsApp number. Because okay. sometimes you only need people to encourage you, mm -hmm. not even the money, but people to encourage you, people to share their own life experiences. And if I can share mine with you, you will know that if I could pass through those stages and get to where I am now, you can do it and you will do it better and achieve better. And that's my prayer for all the youth of Africa. I, I will prefer you to do this Disturb me as many times as you, as you can disturb me. It is a duty for me to respond back to you than for you to take your money and go through illegal means to go and die at the Mediterranean Sea or to go and die in the Sahara or to go and become and, and to go and start seeking asylum anywhere else in the world. I believe that together we are stronger and that is why we are here. I see my job as a mission, not just to come and sit here as a political, but as a mission and as a mission to deliver and to help as many people that can help. So education is the key and the right kind of education. Even if you've read, can you imagine that I read English? Do you know that my degree is in English? But now I'm commissioner of what? Human Resource Science and Technology. Because once you have your qualifications, you can adapt and you can get people, your brain is open to learn. For me, every day is a learn, is a day to learn because you never can ever, ever know. That is what we say in academic. There's no absolute in academics. Nobody knows. I can learn from you. I can learn from a one-year-old, from a two-year-old, but the mind has to be open. So don't give up and don't stop chasing your dreams. When people tell you that you cannot make it, look at them and reject it. Because my father taught me something. It's not everybody that has a right to speak into your life, particularly those who, who, who make you feel desolate, particularly those who make you feel that your situation is hopeless. When you speak to them, instead of them uplifting you, they bring your spirit down. You don't need such people around you. Avoid them to speak to you. But speak to people who can help you, who can, who can, who can stimulate you to think that, no, 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 I can still make it. It, it. it can be done. And you can still make it wherever you found yourself. And for those who are pregnant, don't think that because you are pregnant, you cannot achieve life dreams. I have many, many around me as friends and many, many around me as my students that are brought up as my daughters who have, after pregnancy, continued their school, even up to a PhD, and now they sit in their offices. Don't let anybody make you think that when you have an education, you cannot have a husband. That is a bloody lie. A man who is confident will still walk up to you and tell you that, I want to marry you. So you need to develop yourself. And in developing yourself, you build your own confidence. You build your own character. It is very, very important. And, and, at, and at that time, you also build your own competence. Have used the word character, confidence, and, um, and competence. You need to do that. And you can get that through education. Commissioner, oh my God. I knew my when I would ask you that question, you will speak from the heart and you will inspire all these young people. You have no idea in the chat box Young people have been cheering and, and saying respect and, and they agree with you and they feel very motivated because you know in these challenging times, many have mental health challenges right now and many are falling into depression and they need your words of wisdom and inspiration. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I can't thank you enough for inspiring all these young people who are watching us. Humility, competence, confidence, the girls who have the right to go to school, all of these words of wisdom uh, for sure will carry on with these young people who have been with us today. So thank you again for your time. I know you have to run to another webinar. Thank you very much, Aya. Thank you. And thank you to all the youth who have participated. Together we are stronger and don't give up. <laughs> don't give up. Together we're stronger. Don't give up. Never ever. Yeah. Want to. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. All right. Um, so this was uh, such an inspiration uh, from Commissioner uh, of HRST, Human Resources, Science and Technology Commissioner of the African Union, who shared with you her words of wisdom <clears throat> and also her personal experience as a student before in the 90s, but also as an educator and in her role of leadership now at the African Union. So I want to move now to a, a message also of solidarity from the uh, Secretary General, the eighth Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency Ban Ki-moon, who also sent us a, a message on this topic of education. Honorable Commissioner Professor Sarah Anyang Agbo, dear African Union Youth Envoy, Ms. Aya Chebi, dear Global Citizens of Africa, uh, today the world is faced with a tremendous challenge. The COVID-19 pandemic is a threatening our health and well-being, as well as our current healthcare infrastructures and the global economy. This virus does not differentiate between our country, region, religion, gender, race, or economic class. It affects us all and requires a unified response. Countries both in the global north and south are working tirelessly to fight the virus and to keep their citizens safe and economies stable. Global citizenship, multilateralism, and compassion are all the same in spirit. If we lack global citizenship and leadership, we cannot have unified solidarity and multilateralism in times of crisis. In Africa, the virus has spread across the continent in a matter of weeks. Experts warn that the fragile healthcare systems in many African countries could be overwhelmed in the face of a severe outbreak of COVID-19. The support of the international community is vital for Africa to successfully navigate this pandemic. In this respect, the work of the WHO is a key. Africa is now approaching its peak of COVID-19 cases, and there is a great need for sufficient test kits and protective gears. Capacity building should also be made available to Africans to deploy rapid responders. We need generations of citizens who take on the challenges of the world and find the local solutions for them in the spirit of global citizenship. The education about the sustainable development goals is a key to understand the interconnectedness of our planet. Indeed, education is one of the primary pillars of the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens. This year, we were initially scheduled to organize a scholarship program to empower African youth in coordinating with the University of Bordeaux and Velex Group. However, due to COVID-19, we have adapted the program to take place virtually, and we hope that it will be possible to meet our scholars and to award them with their certificates in 2021. The program includes online training on COVID-19 in Africa, multidisciplinary insights, one-on-one -on -one mentoring during the implementation of a SDG micro project, and hands-on practice on planning and pitching projects to an expert board. In addition to the scholar program for students from Africa, the Ban Ki-moon Center offers three 
free online courses on the SDGs, global citizenship, and gender equality. We hope that these courses will be helpful, learning tools during these uncertain times. I want to commend Ms. Aya Chebi, the youth envoy of the African Union, and her team for her important work for youth and for the initiatives undertaken to address the COVID-19 global crisis. African youth have and will continue to play a key role in addressing this global crisis. I am impressed to see the actions that the Office of the African Union Youth Envoy has already taken to engage youth in discussions around COVID-19. Africa is a booming continent with the biggest young generation we have ever witnessed. The active engagement of young people will be vital to addressing this global crisis. Let us continue to motivate youth to take action and ensure that boys' and girls' rights are protected and enforced strongly and equally. I urge all of you to continue your dedicated efforts and to remain determined. We must be united as a global citizens and work together to rise beyond this crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, former SG of the United Nation. Uh, very grateful for your intervention, Your Excellency, and I want to thank you for your continuous support, especially young people uh, and girls, particularly amid this pandemic and championing uh, global citizenship. Uh, I want to also thank uh, Julia Zimmerman and her entire team at the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens for the continuous collaboration. You can also check out uh, the Ban Ki-moon Center uh, scholarship uh, that was launched uh, this year, uh, which is a really innovative program. Uh, so I think this is also an example that uh, education is in, it should be um, uh, reinforced or supported by different partners to make sure that uh, African youth have the opportunities they deserve across the continent and beyond. Uh, I want to um, conclude uh, by few announcements or, or few information. We have been running two polls. Firstly, I hope you can still participate in these polls. There was one on has COVID-19 affected, disrupted your study? And there is a 70% majority saying yes. And there is another poll uh, saying amid COVID-19, what are the challenges facing education? Uh, no access to internet, lack of infrastructure, uh, not able to um, uh, access dependence on school meals and other options that you can choose. So please participate in the polls as I uh, wrap up. Uh, and I wanted to also uh, say that we had a great uh, Africa Liberation Day on Monday. I hope you all enjoyed the Africa Solidarity Concert we hosted with AFRIMA. And special thanks to the Division of Culture under the uh, Social Affairs Department, uh, especially Angela, uh, for the wonderful collaboration. The fundraising campaign for the Africa COVID-19 Response Fund, it's still on. So find out more on our social media, how to support and share. Uh, we also convened the intergenerational dialogue on youth engagement and silencing the guns uh, as part of the theme of the year. So you can also watch that on the Facebook page if you missed it. And the last thing uh, I want to remind you of is Saudi blog application. The application is still running until the 31st of May. Uh, the call is for young African women between 20 and 35 years old, and we will select contributions from 25 young women that would be published as a digital uh, publication. So you can submit in Arabic, French, and English. Go to auyouthenvoy.org slash Saudi for more information. And lastly, if you are organizing an event, please do share with us. Uh, we have a calendar event on the website, auyouthenvoy slash all uh, dash events. So we can display any webinars or events that you are organizing. Uh, it's, it's an event calendar open to everyone Focus on Africa that could be useful for young people to pick up some webinars, trainings, uh, conversation opportunities uh, that they're looking for. 
We come to the end of our webinar. Let's ensure uh, our advocacy continue for education for all um, and that you know, school is not disrupted, especially for the most vulnerable and the most at risk, and especially for girls uh, who most likely uh, drop school uh, uh, because of, of many issues, whether pregnancy or periods or now with COVID-19. Uh, but I want to thank you really for joining us. I'm seeing a lot of engagement on the chat box. I'm seeing a lot of comments uh, on the Facebook uh, page. I know I didn't get a chance to ask all your questions, but I think the main question you have been asking over and over again is on the digital divide. And I hope you got these answers from Commissioner of HRST. Uh, let's continue the conversation on Twitter. Use the hashtag Africa Youth Lead, hashtag Africa Youth Lead, and continue to comment on the live uh, Facebook. Uh, and you can also send us emails on the VAUCS at auyouthenvoy.org. VAUCS at auyouthenvoy.org is Virtual AU Youth Consultation Series. That's the acronym for it. Let's continue to engage, advocate, and organize, and unite, and play our part. Thank you for joining, and see you next Wednesday.